Take me out of the bed, and I look back, and my body is not in the bed. So I realize I'm going. And they take me through the roof, and it just, I just, I was like, I was through the roof so fast, I just didn't even hardly know you went through it other than, whoa, where's the roof? And while I am there, uh, and I land, I land, if, if we're here, I land 3,000 years earlier. And this is the time of David. In fact, David was not king yet. He had been anointed by Samuel the first time, but he had not been anointed the second time. And I land and I know what I'm to do. I don't I can't tell you how I knew. I just I land. I just I just land. And I land in a marketplace of Jerusalem. And it's covered with like a, a, a brush arbor type of covering one side is and then there's a, a street that's three chariots wide and then on the other side is this same same look on the other side a uh, marketplace and the first thing that I'm struck with is the stench and it's hard to describe I I, I mean I, I guess I just thought it was like pristine but it was not it was um, urine, animal urine, mixed with human urine, mixed with melons, mixed with flies, mixed with meat, mixed with things hanging, peppers, various things hanging, mixed with beans, um, cantaloupe, all, all, all this, all in the same air. And so the first thing that, I, that happens, I... I'm choking because of the air. I'm <laughs> choking. The next thing I notice is the dirt on the children's faces and hands and the dirt in the knuckles of the merchants. I just assumed it would be cl much cleaner than that, but it, it was not. And that's what impressed me about the Bible, the, the, uh, the movie, the Bible, as he depicted the uh, the people and the the dirt they lived in, and it, it, I was not prepared for that. Now I've been I didn't tell this since the the movie. I've been telling this for the last you know twenty years. So I let and so the next thing I know is I'm I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I know what I'm supposed to do. I am dressed like they are. I'm in a, a linen outfit or a garment, not linen maybe, but garment, and a robe. I have a, a rope around my waist. I have sandals on. I am to tell them that David is, God's desire is that David be the next king of Israel. That Saul will die in battle soon. And God's desire is David be the next king. And I would... I would think that sentence and, and, and that he would lead them into victory after victory over the Philistines and would be a great, the greatest king Israel's ever had. Uh, I would think that sentence in English and it would come out my mouth in Hebrew and I would hear them in Hebrew but enter my brain in English and so it was easy to converse with them and I knew I'm talking in Hebrew and I understood it in English. I did not understand the Hebrew words that I said, but I understood it in English. I, it was like in my brain. I know, oh, yes. Yeah. And so we're, I'm easily conversing with them. And some of the people go, of course David's going to be our king. We already have the song. David, Saul is slain his thousands and David is 10,000. And a couple of them even sang kind of a, a little lilt of that to me. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, that was really a song. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of a euphemism, or, but it was really a song. And others would say, no, 
David is not going to be your king. He's a little, little kid. Saul is strong and tall and rugged and handsome, and he's already led us into victories over the Philistines. No, not David. No way. No, not we will not take David as king. We will not make David king. And Saul is not going to die. We have a great army. And then others would go, ah, king, king. So I, um, the, the marketplace is about, oh, 75 yards long, 50 to 75 yards long. And I was not to, I was not to talk to anybody other than to tell them these things. So some of the people would say, are you a prophet? We need a, we need to hear from a prophet. Are you a prophet? And I go, no, I'm just a man of God trying to do what God has asked me to do, leave me alone. And I would move on. I'd literally grab me by the arm. I'd yank my arm out of the arm and move on down the street. In the meantime, while I'm moving down the street, I'm thinking, my wife is not going to be able to collect our insurance policy. <laughs> it, I'm, I will, I'm a missing person. It'll be seven years, and she's going to think I left her with all the people in Jerusalem. I'm thinking, what am I going to do for a living? Well, I'm, a, I'm a, by hobby, I'm a carpenter, but then I realize no power tools. So I do. This is going to be different. This is going to be different. I'm not sure I'm that good at a handsaw with a handsaw anymore. I don't know where I'm going to stay. I'm, and so I'm talking to people. I'm moving. And in between people, I'm thinking these rational cognitive thoughts. I get down to the, I get down to the end of the end of the marketplace. And I look across the street. Well, actually, I was headed that way. But I look across the street and a young man has been following me down, down the street. And I know it was David. And he radiated light all around him. Very clear light. It was easy for me to see. I, I'm, I'm guessing others saw it because I saw it so easy. And it's like he kept one eye on me and one eye on the person. He had talked to somebody over there, but he watched me. So and by the time I get down to the end of the street, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to find a place to stay. I've got to find a way to live. And because I can't get myself back. I cannot get myself back. And I, and I, you know, it's like I can't pick up a cell phone and call my wife. And I'm really worried she, about what she's going to be thinking. But here I am. What do I do? And so he motions to me. You, come here. And I go, look around and, I'm, and, they, and I go, who? And he goes, you, come here. So I, I walk out into the middle of the street. He walks out into the middle of the street. And he's like, he's not five foot tall. And he probably didn't weigh 105 pounds. And, but he was very GQ-esque. I'm telling the chiseled, kind of reddish face, but incredibly green, or blue-green eyes. And he's looking at me in the eyes, and he reaches up and takes my, to, to take my hand. I reach and take his hand like this. And he had little bitty hands, small hands. And he had long, dark red hair, almost so dark, it was almost black red, auburn hair. And it had waves in it, deep waves, not curls, but waves. And I mean, this, I, think, I, I remember thinking, this guy could have been a model, I'm telling you. You make him six foot or six foot two, this kid's a model. He'll make a zillion dollars. And so he's looking at me and he says this. He says, I know who you are. I know who sent you and we'll meet again. And at that moment, a cart goes by full of melons and a burrow goes by with gunny sacks of something on its back. And when they pass, Whoosh, I'm taken. 
I land in bed and I'm bouncing in the bed. My heart is about to jump out of my chest. I can't catch my breath. Diane, my wife rolls over and she goes, John, do you feel the presence of the Lord here? She rolls back over and goes to sleep and I'm going, ah, 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 ah. So I decide, um, I'm going, what in the world did you do that for? Why did you do that to me? How am I, how, you think I'm going to be able to tell people this? What did you do? Why did you do that? What is going on? And I heard the Lord. And, and, and here's what he said, and it's all he has ever said. He said, I never do anything. No, he said, there's more to the great cloud of witnesses than you understand. And I never do anything without a witness. And I realized he took me back in time because I could witness what happened after David was king. And I realized I wasn't the only one he had done this with. Various people in time had been taken back to tell David was to be king. And I knew whatever, I don't know what there's different levels of it or categories of it, but whatever there is, I was part of a great cloud of witnesses on that issue. And so I tell you that because it's a type of portal. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. My authorized by myself a version of that is, if you can think of it, it's not strange enough in God. Well, I decided I was going to go down and tell the group as if it was a dream. So we have from seven to eight, we have um, prayer. And from eight to nine, we had uh, breakfast. And then at nine o'clock, we would leave to go on the tour. So seven o'clock, I go down and I'm going to tell the people the strange dream that I had. And uh, I start to tell them. And about a minute and 18 seconds into it, I realize I made a mistake. Because now they're thinking, we're in Jerusalem with a cult leader. He paid our way here. He's got our tickets. He's paying for the hotel. We're never going to get back. And the Kool-Aid is coming out pretty quick. So I'm not, I, that even makes me less happy. And so we, we finish prayer, we're eating breakfast, and the tour guide comes and he says, would you like to go to a new excavation in, in the old city? And I said, nah, let's go on to Masada. And he says, well, you might be interested in this. And I said, well, I've seen everything. And he said, well, you haven't seen this because it just opens today. And I said, I said, well, whatever they want, let's, we'll do it. And so the group was kind of gathered around. He says, what do you want to do? You guys want to go see it or do you want to go on to Masada? They go, let's go see it. They go, oh, great. I just wanted to disappear. So we go into the old city and I'm, I'm reading a placard in this excavation area that they had and, and about what I was looking at. And I hear my, the tour group coming and they're, they're laughing. And, you know, you're not supposed to make a lot of noise in these places because they're kind of semi-sacred type of things. And so I'm, I'm looking, I'm trying to get them to be quiet and they ignore me. And so they come up to me and they said, John Paul, you got to come with us. And I said, well, let me finish reading this and I'll go. And I said, no, now. And they literally yanked me down the rest of the, the scaffold and down some stairs and down the hallway and down some more scaffolding and down and turned a corner and down another hallway and then turned left and took about three steps. And boom, there I am. They had rebuilt the marketplace at the time of David. A short segment of it, only about 
30 feet. And it was exactly like it, except for one shade, the shade of green they chose was a little bit darker than the shade of green it really was, because it was a light green, but it's still a different shade off on the on part of the wall, the wall, inside wall. And I mean, I, I became so overloaded that in about two seconds, I had dropped down to the, to the, the street and, and, and they were telling me these were the stones of the street because they read the placard there said these are the stones of the street of the marketplace. And I, my tears are falling on stones that are ra- a little rounded. And when I last saw them, they were flat. And I can't, I'm, a, I'm on overload because I was here 3,500 years ago or, or 3,000 years ago. I was here five hours ago and now I'm here again. And it's just overload. So when I, I got composed and I was able to stand up, or they helped me get up actually, they took me down to the end of the excavation that had 151st Psalm released from the Dead Sea Scroll Museum. I know there's only 150, but they released this. And it describes David, the smallness of his hands, the redness of his hair, a maker of harps. And says, God chose me, the least of my brethren, God chose me to be the leader of his great people, Israel. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the group knew I had not been here because it just opened. And everything I described, they saw built. And so, God, again, gave proof, confirmation to an unusual moment. And I tell you this, not not because it's important what happened to me. I tell you this because my mother and father taught me from my youth, God is still God. And he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And I was raised with that. And that may be why so much happens to me. But I also know this, and I read it earlier, that when you have a a contrite heart, a broken and contrite heart and spirit, God will be close to you and he will do things you can't even dream of and pride will separate you from that. So I want to encourage you. Let God be God. Seek him. Study your gift. Get to know him. Have relationship with him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this other will be added to you.